Hey, everybody. Welcome to Red May, your one-month vacation from capitalism. We are beginning part two of our program of 43 events. So that means there are probably, I don't know, about 20, 23 left. Uh, we have over 110 speakers this year. I counted them once. Uh, and you're probably wondering, or if you aren't, you should be, how do we get all these people involved? Uh, you must have a huge budget. Uh, well, we don't. We depend on volunteer power and also uh, by your contributions because there's no institutional support for a Kami event like this one. So uh, if you want to see this continue to happen, and by the way, this is our fifth year. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, that we can keep doing, have done this madness for five years and uh, given the uh, rate of failure of American small business uh, uh, that undercuts that American dream which never seems to die. At any rate, we are still here living that dream thanks to you and we hope that we will continue to do it for another five years. So go to our website, www.redmayseattle.org and uh, under donate, you have two options. You can go to Fan the Flames of Red May or GoFundMe and uh, give a one-time contribution to that. Or we have a link to a Patreon. You can become a patron. $3 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month. Find your level. Anything helps. Uh, you can also find a link to the donate in the uh, YouTube description uh, of this event, Beyond Oppression and Exploitation. Uh, what I want to tell you quickly before I introduce the narrator of today's event, uh, Ico Day, is what we've got coming up uh, over the next few days, uh, which of course you can find on the calendar, but just to whet your appetite a bit. At uh, 5 p.m. today, we have the asset economy and <clears throat> the logic of speculation uh, with Martin Konings, uh, and uh, Lisa Atkins and Stephen Shaviro. Um, tomorrow at 11 a.m., Mark's producing subjects, a conversation between Sandro Mazadra in Italy and Jason Reed in Maine. And finally at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, how to weaponize or diffuse a constitution. Uh, that has the authors of two new great books that come have come out about constitutions. Uh, uh, Aziz Rana, well, it hasn't come out, it's about to, on uh, constitutional veneration in America, and uh, which is unique to America and almost no other country in the world sort of loves a document of scripture the way we do. And uh, also uh, systemic corruption by Camila Vergara, who is, uh, uh, we'll also update a little on the glorious events in Chile, where she's from, where a terrible constitution is about to be replaced, and it looks like this one uh, is going to have no input from right-wing or centrist politicians. It's absolutely amazing. Maybe it can inspire us. But now, enough of that. Let's get down to today's event, Beyond Oppression and Exploitation. I want to introduce you uh, to our narrator, uh, Aiko Day. Uh, she, says, she, okay, move your lips and enunciate. Aiko Day is associate, profe associate professor of English and critical social thought at Mount Holyoke College. Uh, she is uh, in the Asian Pacific American Studies program. Her research focuses on Asian North American literature and visual culture, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism, Marxist theory, and queer of color critique. She's also the author of Alien Capital, but most important at all, she is a Red May alum several times and was here for the first Red May. So welcome back again as always, and I salute you for wearing red. You're an inspiration to us all. If I didn't think I looked good only in black, I would be wearing red too. Uh, thank you, Philip, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm excited to introduce our wonderful panelists today and to hear their remarks and, and to help celebrate Ashley's fantastic book, Marxism and Intersectionality. 
So our first and featured panelist is Ashley Bohr, who is a scholar activist based in Chicago and assistant professor of gender and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame. She holds a PhD in philosophy from DePaul University. Um, and along with Justin DeLeon, she co-hosts the Pedagogies for Peace podcast, and she currently serves as the public philosophy editor for the blog of the American Philosophical Association. In addition to her academic work, Ashley devotes much of her time to social movements for intersectional and anti-capitalist liberation. At the moment, she spends most of her movement time working with uh, the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, Jewish Voice for Peace, and the Chicago chapter of Never Again Action. You can read more about her work at ashleybohr.com. Second in our lineup is Michael Hart, who teaches at Duke University. He is co-director of the Social Movements Lab and serves as editor of the South Atlantic Quarterly. His latest book, co-written with Antonio Negri, is Assembly. And our third and final speaker is Chandan Reddy, who is associate professor in the departments of Comparative History of Ideas and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington, Seattle. He is the author of Freedom with Violence, Race, Sexuality, and the U.S. State from Duke University Press. And he is a core member of Decriminalize UW, which seeks to abolish campus policing. So welcome again to our panelists. It's a delight to have you all here with us today. So now I'm gonna turn this over to Ashley. Thanks so much, Aiko, for that introduction. And thank you so much to Philip and everyone else at Red May for putting together this event. And thanks so, so much to Michael and Chandan and, and everyone else for being here. It's really such an honor to have your work engaged with by people who are so, like whose work has had such an effect on me and um, my intellectual development and who are also so clearly committed not to thinking about these questions because they're abstract and interesting, but because we have an actual world to win. Um, the first thing that I, I wanna say is that I'm calling in right now uh, from my apartment on the South side of Chicago, which sits on the unceded homelands of several indigenous tribes including the Council of the Three Fires, comprised of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nation, um, in addition to various other indigenous peoples who have and continue to make Chicago their home. There is no conversation we can have in the United States about exploitation or oppression that does not confront the fact that our, our lives, uh, our economy, and also our love and our struggle takes place on stolen land. Um, and through stolen lives. So um, with all of that, as like incredible preface, um, I thought that for um, maybe those of you who are watching who are maybe not familiar with the book, that maybe I would say a little bit about, <laughs> about what goes on in it and why I wrote it. Um, so as Aiko said, uh, I spend a lot of my time in both academic and activist spaces. And I'd say for about the last 10 or so years, uh, I was sort of straddling two worlds. And on the one hand, I was in a ton of Marxist spaces where the dominant discourse around intersectionality was that it was some sort of reductive, liberal to reactionary identity politics that was a distraction from fighting capitalism and in no way could help us do anything useful why are you, why can't you just talk about class? Marx said everything we ever needed to know in 1867. So like, what are we still going on about? And on the other hand, I spent a lot of time in feminist and queer and anti-racist spaces where I would say the dominant understanding of Marxism and anti-capitalist theory more broadly was like, ah, a bunch of white brochalists and Marx bros are going to talk down to me and tell me that the vast, vast, vast sources of violence that inframe my life are a distraction from liberating some macho worker on the factory floor in a kind of throwback to a world that sort of no longer exists. So like, why are you talking about that? And, uh, you know, obviously there are occasionally people in conversations that live up to these terrible stereotypes. Um, but what I was reading and the people I was engaging with and the organizing I was doing and the texts I was reading 
really had nothing to do with either of these caricatures. Um, and rather, for me, both Marxism and intersectionality are traditions that are committed to understanding the violence that inframes our life and how we can move people together in mass movements in order to fight back and to birth a different kind of world. Um, and so for me, I wanted to get away from some of the, you know, like silly caricatures and backhanded arguments to really engage with the meat of these um, traditions. And I talk about them in the book, both as traditions. And for me, that's really important because, you know, there is any, any end of the sentence Marxists believe or intersectionality scholars think, like there's gonna be someone who claims that title that actually doesn't, for whom the rest of that sentence doesn't make any sense. So for me, I think about Marxism and intersectionality in the book as traditions, which means they're heterogeneous. They have lots of people that are, in, are answering similar questions in different ways. There are internal debates and disagreements and holding on to this like vibrancy is really important because while there are people who kind of live up to the stereotypes that I talked about a few minutes ago, there's also a lot else that's happening there. And so rather than approach, you know, other people's thought with like a hermeneutics of derision and suspicion and trying to point out why their ideas are bad, my approach was like, wait, how can we key in on the things that are useful, that are helpful in both of these traditions, and how can I get them to talk to each other so that we can have a deeper conversation, both about the analysis of the world that we live in and strategically about how to fight it. Um, and so that's, I, I hope, what the book does a little bit, or at least um, contributes to. Um, broadly, the book is, is broken into three parts. The first part really talks about the genesis of the term intersectionality and tries to uncover some of the hidden history of the way that Black women organizers whose thought was central to the development of the term intersectionality and to the intersectional tradition more broadly were themselves engaging class politics, even sometimes in the Communist Party um, and other distinctly, overtly, explicitly Marxist organizations and how struggles around class and capitalism was always central to the prehistory of the intersectional tradition. And on the other side, how going back several decades and even centuries, concerns about race and gender and sexuality were also incorporated into Marxist theory and Marxist organizations and Marxist struggle, even if they were sometimes maligned or deprioritized in that struggle and in those organizations. Um, the second part of the book really um, focuses on debates between Marxism and intersectionality. It goes through why I think these caricatures are wrong. Um, it breaks down like almost every uh, you know, accusation I've heard from one camp to the other. Um, and talks about why I think most of them are pretty wrong and why the ones that have a kernel of truth are actually not uh, as representative or as useful uh, as, as <laughs> I guess as detractors want them to be. Um, and then the third section of the book is the last three chapters. I really, I, I try to talk about what I think is gained from bringing Marxism and intersectionality into conversation with each other. And it's there that I make what I think is hopefully the, the biggest theoretical contribution of the book, um, which is to say that I think we need to re-understand what we mean by the term capitalism, um, specifically to think about how both oppression and exploitation are neither the same thing, but they're, they're not the same thing, but they are both equally important to the history of capitalism, to its logic, and to its mechanisms of reproduction. And what I hope that helps us see is that we can think about the different ways that capitalism uses oppression and relies on exploitation in order to destroy our communities and our lives. And at the same time, we can recognize that the only effective way to fight for ourselves and to fight for our communities is to fight the logic of exploitation and to undo the deep 
horrors of racism and heterosexism and ableism that are totally central to the way capitalism has operated, continues to operate, and gets reproduced over time. Um, I use this to really think about the fact that in the kind of like class politics or identity politics like framework, we're given a false choice. For me, the answer is we can only do class politics well if we are doing anti-racism, if we are doing feminism, if we are doing queer theory, if we are doing Palestine liberation, if we are doing anti-settler colonial work. That's the only time we are doing good, effective, expansive class politics and vice versa. We cannot unseat the, you know, the structures of racism or heteropatriarchy or imperialism or anything else and leave capitalism intact. There is no liberal solution to those structures. For me, that means that we need to start thinking about or not start. I mean, lots of people are talking about this. I'm not, I'm not quite as new as I'm making it sound here, but like, um, we need to really digest, I think, the insights that so many others have, have um, really bravely defended that these systems are so intertwined, they are so intermeshed, that the only solution to, uh, to capitalism and racism and all the rest is to fight them all at once and to fight them together. And so I hope um, that reframing capitalism in this way contributes to um, both a kind of theoretical and academic reframing of how we understand the problem that we're fighting and also can help us politically refuse so many of the false choices and false narratives that were offered in any in actual day-to-day -day slog of resistance um, so that we can, yeah, like we can build a world worth fighting for. So hopefully, uh, hopefully some of that came through. We'll see. Thanks so much. Aiko, should I start right away? Yes. Okay. Good. <clears throat> uh, thanks. I'm 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 Michael Hart, but you know, on on Zoom, we don't have to say who we are anymore because we're already all labeled with um, with tags. So, um, I, so I, I was um, yeah delighted to be part of this event um, with re re referring to Ashley's book, but also with um, Chandon and Aiko because I wanted to raise some of my own questions, which I think you three are excellent people to answer. I, I found um, Ashley's book uh, super interesting and, and also particularly for me because I feel like I'm trying to move. Let's see. <clears throat> Tony Negri and I several years ago have thought, um, tried to work through a theory of multiplicity. It, empire is a notion of multiplicity, the concept of multitude itself. But we had not, and one of the things I've <clears throat> We've been trying in more recent years. We have not, we had not originally uh, cast this in the terms that that um, Ashley's just talking about, and 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 I think it's part of the transformation for us has been to um, continue the project of multiplicity we had, but think it now in terms of structures uh, of power relating to race, uh, gender, sexuality, coloniality ableism and others. And so um, in some ways, it very much coincides with what Ashley's saying. You know, what, actually, I just want to reinforce two things that Ashley just said that I, I thought were really important about the book. One is to displace displace a number of distractions, you know, uh, stereotypes, I think, as you were saying, and point to scholars and traditions, activists, scholars and activists, both that have been doing this kind of work and, and draw from that. But also to recognize that this is still an ongoing project. Uh, and it's not um, something that one, it, 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 in ongoing project, a uh, problematic, it involves all kinds of difficulties that are not easily, easily wished away. Um, so I want to think in, in a way about, I, I think one thing, even though Ashley doesn't put in this ter terms, what she is trying to work out is a theory of multiplicity. And so I want to work out, do this a little bit more um, and come back to it. So here, I get, let me give you a problem that I arrive at thinking along the lines with with Ashley here. Um, get by and and, and I'll, I guess I'll repeat this when I get to, to asking a question. It's not a problem I see with Ashley, not at all. It's a problem I see with me and that's where I'm trying to get 
what I'm trying to get at. Okay, so I think that things this when when Tony and I are thinking of need to develop empire, or really develop the concept of multitude, or maybe both. Um, and we had recently been trying to do this in terms of a, a a revised notion of class that we call class prime, but I won't burden us with that. It seems to me there are three ways we're trying to we're trying to move in this. One is to, um, like I said, to account for and engage multiple structures of power and organization of liberation in terms of race, gender, sexuality, coloniality. Yeah. So in some ways, that put put our work in dialogue with and, and learn from, you know, theories of these multiplicities of power. The second, and this is what I'm going to go into, to develop a concept of, of articulation that's adequate to the mode and logic of relation among the elements of a multiplicity. Like this is what, when one starts saying a, a no, notion of multiplicity, I think one has to ask about that, that nature and logic of, of, of relation. And then the third problem is to confront a political problem of the relationship between two multiplicities, because I think every theory of political multiplicity is always double. In other words, it's always a theory of uh, the multiple structures of power, but also a theory of the multiple struggles for liberation, which are not reducible to one. And so, and, and so I wanna see both the, those two multiplicities, but the relationship between the two and that's what I'm going to come back to in a minute. So to get there, just to give, I, 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 I feel the need, I guess, always to go through certain kind of textual thing. I wanted to just try to describe what I'm thinking of in terms proposed by um, an essay by Stuart Hall that many of you will know, published in 1980 about articulation and dominance. He's reading about race and, race and class and race and capital in South Africa. Um, and he goes through much of the essays reading South African Marxists uh, try to understand this, but then he comes um, through at the end, and he's doing it through a rather, rather creative reinterpretation of Louis Althusser's notion of articulation. Um, yeah, which you don't have to pay attention to that part. So, I mean, on the one hand, he's recognizing here, I'm just going to say things that are going to seem perfectly obvious that race and capital, uh, to say that they are articulated in such a society like apartheid South Africa. It means that neither is autonomous. In other words, capital doesn't exist without racial hierarchy and racial hierarchies don't exist without capital. Um, the one doesn't derive from the other or hold supremacy in a kind of structure, superstructure kind of way. Instead, it means to say they're articulated that race and capital are at once relatively autonomous and mutually constitutive that they stand on equal footing. I mean, uh, Ashley uses the term, I guess I wanna come back to this, of equa primordiality, uh, but it's a stand, they stand on equal footing and yet they're inseparable. And so that's the, the notion of, of mediation. But he has one other aspect that, that poses then a complication for me, again, thinking about all of this here, which he says uh, that although race and class are on, in principle on equal footing, in a specific conjuncture, one structure can play a dominant role. And so Hall gives two examples for this, that it first that in in uh, uh, plantation slave societies in the Americas that uh, in those agricultural uh, modes of production there, that race is a structure and dominance with respect to capital in plantation slavery. Whereas in post-emancipation US, race and capital are of course still articulated, but then in these societies, capital is a structure of dominance with respect to race. The, 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 the point really is that one can be in a structure of dominance with respect to the other. I would go through, I should skip something I just prepared to go along with this about capitalist patriarchy. It seems to me that both, because I think it's exactly the same idea in theories of capitalist patriarchy. Patri heteropatriarchy and capital are, are, are they're relatively autonomous and yet, and yet inseparable and mutually constitutive. But, and that's, maybe that's the easy part, it's certainly not easy, actually, to tell you the truth. But anyway, um, the, that's the first part. But the second is, in a specific conjuncture, I guess I am saying what I was prepared, even though I said I wasn't going to. In a specific conjuncture, one can be uh, dominant with respect to the other. Uh, the, the example I had was from the old classic essay of, of um, Heidi Hartman, Marx, uh, the unhappy marriage of Marxism and feminism, in which she she gives examples of maybe I don't need to go in these you know one conjuncture in which capital is predominant with respect to patriarchy and another which patriarchy structures the relation of capital. Um, 
so you get what I you get what I'm so now I mean one would have to do and this to to fill out even where what what Ashley's already laid out is is one would have to think of this in a in a uh, properly multiplicitous context you know that we're not just talking about capitalist patriarchy and racial capital but but a, but a panoply of structures of power and Right. So then I have two conceptual points now just repeating. The first is that there are mul multiple structures of domination that are each relatively autonomous, but also mutually constitutive, intrinsically tied in that way. Um, but the second is that in a specific conjuncture, one can fill a role of predominance over the other. That seems to me now, now I'm going to get to the political problem and then I'll shut up, which is um, it seems to me that that one could say this would be uh, let's imagine that or like take take for granted that don't imagine that let's take for granted for a moment that that in contemporary us power dynamics race plays the role of a structure and dominance with respect to capital and gender and sexuality i i, I, I think we could probably debate that i'm not really sure it's true might be a little easier because I was thinking about uh, Veronica Gago's book about Argentina and Latin America, a, a book about which we will have another Ray, Red May event at the end of at, at the end of the month. I can do advertising that way, and she's she's proposing that gender violence and gender subordination is a structure and dominance with respect to capital and and indigeneity or coloniality, race in in Latin America. So here, then, it seems to me we rise to questions or problems, if one is going to rec recognize the structure of dominance in a specific conjuncture. The first is a conceptual error that this uh, comes back directly to, to Ashley's point, I think. With the, the, the conceptual error would be to read the conjunctural relation of dominance in general or absolute terms. In other words, if one were to recognize that in the US today, race functions as a structure and dominance, to read that as a general priority of race over gender, race over class would be a would be a conceptual error, a confusion of temporalities, a violation of Ashley's uh, primary, sorry, equi primordiality. I had it written down so I wouldn't forget it. Um, so that would be that seems to me okay. That's clear enough to me. I mean that, that that or at least I would take that position. The second one is where I'm really asking you guys a question finally, which is about the political or organizational problem. What is or should be the relationship between the multiplicity of structures of power and the multiplicity of struggles for liberation? Speci and, and especially when one recognized in a specific conjuncture, the dominance of, of one over the others. Does that imply that a similar predominance should function in the structures of organization. It could be, you know, so uh, before going into contemporary example, I mean, this, this is exactly the political orientation against which so many of us and, and those just before us struggled, at least in, in, in European and North American countries, but Latin American too, which, which said that, um, the industrial worker is central in the production of capital and in the present conjuncture that that relation of exploitation with the industrial worker has a has a structure of dominance in that in that conjuncture and therefore the industrial worker needs to be protagonist of struggles organizing the others it, i wonder sometimes so when when now when think about contemporary black lives matter protests you know since george floyd murder they are, in one sense, wonderfully multitudinous. I mean, in the sense that at every Black Lives Matter protest, it's also anti-capitalist. It's also an affirmation of Black trans lives. It's also a recognition of, of, of feminist struggles. But does it, is it, do you, this, this is now an evaluation question. Does it seem that those happen under the umbrella of struggles against white supremacy, rather than as struggles that are all on equal footing and so and 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 organized that way. In other words, should should because in one sense one could say that the one could argue that the 
structure and dominance in a specific conjuncture of, of the relations of power imply or necessitate a priority in organization. My tendency, this is my instinct, uh, would be to insist that the modes of organization refer instead to the equa primordiality of the struggles and rather that, that, that one needs to always make, maintain a, an, or, a, a, an organization of multitude, a, an organization of multi, multiple struggles, always on equal footing and not under the hegemony of one or the other. It would be a similar thing. And this is, I think, something very interesting about Veronica Gago's book is that she struggles against, you know, there too in the assemblies in Argentina, there are, um, they are anti-capitalist struggles and anti-homophobic um, um, struggles and, and indigenous struggles, et cetera. But there's a danger that she's struggling against that um, the feminist component will mediate and in some sense subsume the others. And she's struggling for their relative autonomy. So maybe that's, I, I hope I've, I've uh, articulated enough about what, what I see as the A problem that arises after, I'm totally on board with every where 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 um, where, where Ashley's arrived at, but I arrive at this I arrive at this problem anyway. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there, just hoping that I've I've um, articulated my own difficulties that, um, that that could make some sense. <clears throat> Aiko, should I just jump in as well? Yes, that's, we have lots to talk about now. Yes, we really do. Um, first, I just want to also express my thanks and gratitude to the organizers of Red May. Um, if folks haven't, uh, if folks who are listening right now haven't had a chance to listen to prior episodes, um, almost everything we're going to talk about today and have already talked about today has been thematized in one way or another in the many episodes that have come before us. Um, uh, there was a recent one on porn work that was really rich and fascinating, a recent one on Confessions of the Fox, um, Jody Rosenberg's book um, uh, with Lale Kalili and others that was amazing. Um, and so we just have this trove of, of, of um, uh, resources to think with um, because of the Red May organizers. And I just want to thank them again for continuing to build our intellectual, um, collective intellectual capacities um, through all the work that they're doing to um, create a month long series. Um, uh, I also wanna just uh, say that um, seems imperative to name uh, the structures of settler colonialism on which I work um, and, uh, and, and from which I benefit. Um, I, I live and work on Duwamish lands, um, but as we know, um, central colonialism, set structural uh, settler colonialism, sorry, um, is uh, not an element of a past historical phenomenon, um, but is active um, and shaping our colonial present. Um, and in that way, I'm really inspired um, by the remarkable collective actions of Palestinians um, who have been forcibly divided by the regimes of settler colonialism um, and the systematicity of um, European inherited and European and American derived settler colonialism, um, uh, coldly advocating for um, Palestinian liberation. Um, and, um, you know, we, we have intellectuals like Mariam Boguti, uh, Nora Erekat, uh, Shireen uh, Sekali, uh, Ziad Aburish, uh, so many um, who are pointing um, to, I think one of the main insights that, that, that intersectionality offers us, which is a topic of Ashley's book um, and um, that, that um, Michael was just talking about, you know, which are we, struggles for liberation create knowledge as the structures of power. Um, that are transformative of how we understand um, the conditions of our present, um, uh, what elements are involved in the, in the, in, in the reproduction of our daily lives um, and, um, and how it is that we can actually start in Ashley's language um, to build a different world. Um, so I think that in some ways, um, I wanna thank Ashley for her book in part because it's, it's such a lucid book. Um, it's a book that is trying so hard to um, uh, filter out the noise 
um, all around us um, and share the sort of um, most valuable con concepts that we can glean from important conversations um, to see if those concepts can help us advance um, towards um, uh, better understandings of what uh, Michael was talking about around the multiplicities of struggle um, joined with these multiplicities of liberation. Um, uh, sorry, multiplicities, multiple struggles of power can join with multiple struggles of liberation. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I just want to thank you for that. Um, I also want to say that the book um, is rigorous in its discussion and in its um, uh, in its how it enacts itself about um, citing the sources of um, critical knowledges that oftentimes are appropriated and not cited. Um, and intersectionality is again, just one example of that story of appropriation and non-citation and actually tries very hard um, to intervene and interrupt that. Um, in kind of uh, alliance with that, that effort, I think it's important to just remark that you know it's unclear whether um, the Black radical tradition's uh, very limited institutionalization, um, unlike Marxism, um, it's unclear whether its institutionalization will actually have advancements for Black collective well-being. Um, over and over again, um, we're seeing that the institutionalization of Black knowledges um, and knowledges that have come from the Black radical tradition um, and that have been created by Black intellectuals, Crenshaw among them, but Cedric Robinson and so many others, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, um, Sharice burton Stelly, who I know is going to be on a number of Red May events and um, already spoke on a number, Joy James, et cetera, um, you know, have all alerted us um, uh, to something that, of course, both um, uh, that Barbara Smith and others way long ago, George James, uh, sorry, um, uh, June Jordan, um, uh, way long ago, Barbara Christian pointed out, which is that we're not seeing a correspondence between the institutionalization of Black knowledges and the anti-racist transformation of academic institutions. So we're not seeing more Black scholars and intellectuals in um, uh, English departments, comparative literature departments, uh, polit politics departments, and so forth. Um, we're seeing their, uh, their, to some degree, folks as marginalization um, in specific sites. Um, but we just have to, I think, keep that on the table. Um, and, and I mark my own complicity in that we're, uh, we're having this conversation building on Crenshaw's work on intersectionality on a panel that that doesn't have any um, black scholars um, or activists or intellectuals. So um, I, I just want us to to just be able to hold that and and, and be and and see that as one of the already um, clear insights of black radical thought, um, which is that there is a long story of um, and I think that this really comes out in Kimberly Crenshaw's important. Um, essay in the, the little red book on critical race theory, race reform and retrenchment, which is that the black freedom movement has only had a very recent interaction with reformism, with the efforts of reformism, um, with the efforts to, for example, use the apparatuses of the state, use the apparatuses of liberal institutions um, to produce um, uh, visions of, 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 of social transformation and collective freedom similar to the Palestinian struggle right now. Um, and what I would and what what Crenshaw warns again against is one, analogizing the reformist movement to the black freedom movement rather than seeing that as a point of interface um, and a set of questions. You know, what Stuart Hall talks about as sort of black folks um, walking through institutional uh, regimes for the first time um, and the paradox of, of, of walking through institutional regimes. Um, and then secondly, Crenshaw articulates very clearly in that essay that there is always a revanchist retrenchment against the Black freedom movement through using the reformist categories that the Black freedom movement has had to access to be able to try to produce social transformation. And of course, the dominant reformist category in that way has been rights. So you've seen this kind of remarkable um, retrenchment against um, the efforts of the Black Freedom Movement for much of the, <clears throat> the gains that were tried, that were made and the visions of social transformation that were created um, from 20th century struggles 
through the rubric of trying to reform and rethink rights, and I would think of Crenshaw's intersectionality as one example of that attempt, being the very basis by which, uh, you know, the right movement in the US, the, the, the kind of um, capitalist interests in the US um, have now seized upon the language of law and order and rights um, and freedoms um, precisely, um, one, to create a colorblind law, but precisely to suppress um, and to reverse the gains of the Black freedom movement's interest into reformist spaces. Um, and so this has opened up a number of questions about whether um, engaging with uh, state practices um, and state, state institutions, as well as liberal institutions, will um, continuously only set us up for, recal for these kinds of retrenchments um, and revanchist appropriations. And I thought would be something interesting to put on the table. Um, you know, are there, are there ways to, um, to have liberation movements move through institutional rubrics um, and statist um, formations um, that don't actually, um, in a way, reproduce this cycle of retrenchment? Um, this this uh, economy of retrenchment, in a sense, um, and I think I think some of Ashley's questions around the intersection of Marxism and intersectionality or Black feminist thought um, broadly um, is it can be uh, uh, is addressed to that question, and I think a lot of the efforts right now at highly local um, non-statist uh, kind of organizing um, is coming out of a clarity of this um, difficulty of, of getting out of these, re these retrenchment moments in our movements, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, at least since the 2008 economic crisis, what we've seen over and over again is alliances between what I would call the historically disenfranchised conjoined with the recently disenfranchised, you know, so people who have been made poor, um, who have lost assets, whose, um, whose working conditions are increasingly um, precarious um, or um, non-existent, um, trying to emerge into um, alliance with longer standing movements of, um, of, of both settler colonial and racial capitalist um, disenfranchisement. And over and over again, those alliances have oftentimes broken down um, when um, parts of the recently disenfranchised um, have been able to find access to the state. Um, and I think that right now we're in a very um, important moment for um, feminist thinking um, when we realize that, for example, with COVID, you know, the very first, very first group of workers to be ejected from the workforce um, have been women, and they are now the last group to be coming back into the workforce, at least in the case of the United States. And so, and again, I think maybe that's a structure and dominance. We could like talk about gender structure and dominance in relationship to that. Um, and to go back to what Michael was saying, so the, you know, I think that the work in abolition has really been to interrupt liberal feminism, um, to see if this moment, the structure and dominance in which gender could actually be mobilized for this coalition between the historically disenfranchised and the recently disenfranchised um, as a way to, to advance an effective anti-statist, anti-capitalist movement for social transformation that's conjoined to a critique of our, our kind of colonial present. Um, and so how people make those articulations, like as you see people coming out, I think that one of the things that a structure and dominance, you know, in a, in a kind of Stuart Hall vein argument suggests for us is that we need to be able to actually hear claims between accounts of oppression and demands for uh, transformation that don't actually look logical to one another. So, so it might appear that some, somebody talks about, about the gendered structure of precarity in the workforce and that, that the demand that they make is end policing. 
Um, and that at first looks incoherent to certain subjects. And the goal of our movements right now is actually to show that when you work with the paradigm of a structural dominance, you reveal the coherence between the, the diagnostic condition and the apparent non-analogous demand, apparent only to those who are the recently disenfranchised as non-analogous, but to their alliance with the historically disenfranchised, it becomes so much clearer that capitalism is the structure that's holding racial orders and racial capitalism with settler colonialism and, and, and different forms of empire that Michael and Antonio Negri have um, elegantly analyzed in the in the sort of post 70s period of neoliberalism. So I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you, um, everyone. Th these are really, um, really rich uh, and uh, uh, responses for us to kind of dig in deeper. And I hope that we can, uh, especially uh, on this notion of thinking through structures and dominance, but what forms of organizing. And I think that Chandan's last uh, point about the importance of kind of thinking about putting in, putting into play sort of non-analogous demands, as you put it, and then showing, and the work of activism is actually showing their coherence, right? And so I think that that's a, I think that's really important. I think that's what we're always trying to do, particularly within a critical ethnic studies framework, um, demonstrating those, how something that seems incoherent race and even colonialism or capitalism and, uh, or exploitation and dispossession and things that don't always seem to be uh, to uh, elicit similar forms of organizing are actually very deeply connected. Um, okay, so, but I will actually, there's been some really great questions that have come in, I think that are kind of good clarifying uh, questions, particularly because uh, Michael uh, raised uh, Ashley's concept of equiprimordiality. <laughs> Sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing that right. So someone has actually asked if Ashley could just unpack the, uh, that concept and how it's um, historically relevant to identify equiprimordiality today? And um, are there past communists and socialists we can locate within this appeal? So that's a question from our YouTube audience. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Equiprimordiality, we can all say it together, should have picked a catchier concept. Didn't I didn't learn that. Um, this is what happens when you're an anti-capitalist writer is like you don't think about the branding like that's not the thing that's on your mind when you're writing your your anti-capitalist book i'm sure my publisher would have been way happier had i like picked something snappier uh equiprimordiality is the word that i use and um i like this term because like primordial gives the sense of like you know um sort of deep and foundational right and equi is, you know, the, the, the prefix that equally, right? So like equally foundational to capitalism are oppression and exploitation. That's what I'm trying to get out of it. Um, and specifically, I'm trying to respond to um, accounts of capitalism that are not class only, but are class first, or notions of liberation that are race first and then all the other stuff or like gender first and then everything else which is not the same thing as saying only class or only race or only gender but one is um as someone once said to me but isn't class first among equals <laughs> and so what I was trying to get away from is that I is the misconception that we can have a first among equals uh among uh, in in understanding how capitalism um is organized so I come up with this term, maybe it's, you know, whatever, equiprimordiality, that's the word I use. Um, and I think like, just to, to continue answering this question as I also really wanna get something in to respond to what Michael said, um, is like, I think in a certain sense, what the insight of inter intersectionality in general is that relations and structures of domination are themselves equiprimordial. I don't think this is like a thing I invented. This is like, I think the conceptual innovation, if we were only to identify one, there are several, I have a whole list in my book, but if I think we were to consider one, I would say that what intersectionality gives us is the idea that race, gender, class, sexuality, and ability are equally foundational to the system that we live in. And not only equally foundational, 
actually they're not really even analytically separable in a, in a helpful or coherent way. Which is to say, if we want to understand the totality of the term race, we have to understand by that gender, sexuality, ability, class, et cetera. So this is where I think something like why intersectionality I think is somewhat different from or places a different emphasis on, on how it would explain something like what Hall will call structures and dominance is to say that from an intersectional perspective to say that race is a structure and dominance is all ready to make a claim about gender. It's all ready to make a claim about sexuality. It's all ready to make a claim about settler colonization and class. And so I think where a lot of the confusion that I'm trying to fight with equiprimordiality and that I think intersectionality is trying to fight or has been, has been fighting for several decades is the idea that because like language is hard and it's reductive and you can't like, it, it's like not efficient to communicate by being like, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And by this, I mean, right. And now I have like a whole, you know, like word bubble and we can like dive in and see all of the layers, right. We might say something like race is a structure and dominance. And I think there is incredible analytic and strategic value in making statements like that as long as we understand by race, something that is not separable from, that is totally interwoven with gender, sexuality, coloniality, et cetera, right? Like, and I think the part, I think where we start to get confused and I think, you know, something that Chandan raised is about like how coalitions really break down is like when groups that are in coalition with one another think they can sacrifice each other in order to, you know, gain a little bit more access to institutions of power, a little bit more respectability, a little bit more resources, a little bit more something else, right? Is because I think they're they're not really seeing this kind of equiprimordial, intermeshed, interpenetrating moment, or like they might have had it in in forming a coalitional politics, and then there's an like a, a an externally compelled interest to forsake that. And part of like what I hope we are learning in this moment and something that I'm constantly learning from the Palestinian liberation movement, from the Black Lives Matter movement, like there are so many beautiful historical movements that have shown that we cannot win and sacrifice each other. Like that is not a winning strategy for anyone. And whatever pittance you are able to compel from institutions of power is never gonna be anything like your liberation. And so like you might be able to like survive a bit better or like upgrade, you know, like upgrade your unfreedom a little bit. But what, what is going to come out of that through sacrificing each other is never true liberation. And so just to come back to the second part of that question, which was like, are there past people we can look to in order to make this so clear? The person that I go to at the end of the book is Fannie Lou Hamer, who um, really was talking about how in relationship to race in particular, that her liberation is tied in shackles to the white woman. And like, I make a whole big deal out of this, but I think we can say this really simply, which is to say like, there is no way to achieve liberation. None of us are free until all of us are free. Bam, that's it. That's the Fannie Lou Hamer, right? And I think like both intellectually and strategically in, in organizing, I think we so often start there and then allow for that principle to get chipped away at by the world. And if I'm making any claim, I think in the book, it's like, no, no, this has to be our North Star and our guiding light. Great, uh, thank you. Um, I have a, a, few, a couple other questions. This one comes, uh, it's for anyone, but, also, but specifically to Michael. Um, can you clarify how the oppressions and struggles uh, I think uh, against them are not reducible to each other. Um, maybe I think, okay, you're nodding your head. So I think that you understand what the spirit of the question is. So I'll let you take it away. And maybe we can come back to the larger. Uh, we can also, uh, Ashley and Shannon could also weigh in. Michael, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Michael, you're muted. 
it, it was probably better. I was saying something stupid. Um, so I, I think maybe the machine has a, a brain that says, no, Michael, you're saying something stupid. So I, I did want to just note before coming back to that, that question about the struggles are not reducible. It, sometime later, I'd like Chan and you to talk more about the pedagogical nature of the struggles and the way the struggles themselves reveal the the relation amongst uh, forms of power is something I, I find great and really interesting. Um, I, what I intended, if I'm understanding the question right about this, uh, struggles are not reducible, is that it, sometimes I think once once people say, "Oh, yes, of course, you know, race and class and gender are all are all related," but then, in some ways, um, the those struggles can get folded into one another. You know, to say, okay, well, now I'm going to say it's really class struggle, but class struggle um, is also about race, and class struggle is also about gender. It in a way subsumes the others within it. I mean, in the way, just now I'm just going back to the cliches, but the cliches that were unfortunately dominant, you know, that the uh, socialist or Marxist or communist parties of the up to the 1960s at least said, you know, of course, yes, we have a section on the women question. We have a section on the race question. They certainly dealt with it. But in the end, these are all elements of class. So I think, I mean, I, I would also say that one cannot, it's, it's important to say that capital is a mode of domination that relies on gender, it relies on sexuality, et cetera. But that doesn't make a, a capital the adequate name of the form of domination. It's, it, 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 capital is relatively autonomous from race. Race can't be subsumed. Racial domination cannot be subsumed under capital, and neither can can um, can gender hierarchy. I mean, I think that they are in some ways external to each other too. That's the thing we have to understand: is that they're mutually constitutive, but but neither is. So anyway, that's that's what I meant by the struggles are not reducible. I hope that that makes sense, and that's maybe because to come back to the more philosophical level. That's what's required of a theory of multiplicity, um, or at least in my way of thinking about it, a dialectical notion of mediation could say, yes, there are many, but they could be subsumed within the one. But a notion of multiplicity elements are distinct and, re and, related, and remain exterior to one another, even, in, even while they're related. I hope I'm not going too much on the terminology thing here, but, um, and tell me, Aiko, if I misinterpreted the question, just went on something random. I think that you interpreted it um, fine. Uh, I guess I, I would just maybe just, I was just interested in your, the point that you're making about capital itself being the agent of racism, uh, gender oppression, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if this is a moment to also think about the relationship between capital and the state, um, particularly, and I'm thinking of, you know, concepts like primitive accumulation um, and, um, and, you know, the section of capital where we have all the violence and colonialism and slavery. And it's actually, I mean, one of the points that William Clare Roberts makes is that it's not in fact capitalists who are inflicting the violence and throwing people out, it's actually the state. So the state is parasitic on capital, but it, and so then it becomes, uh, a way for us to kind of think through the way in which, um, as Ruthie Gilmore, you know, puts it, you know, capital, capitalism is, uh, requires inequality and, you know, race enshrines it, but it's really the state, the state operations that actually enshrine, uh, I think, these modes of intersecting domination that um, fall on race, uh, racial and gendered lines. So, I mean, I don't know if that, that, um, I just wanted to just, I don't know if there's anyone wants to jump in on that, but that was just one, just a, just a point about thinking about capital and its relationship to the state, uh, which has increasingly become, you know, a security kind of opera, uh, uh, operation, it seems as well, just to kind of think about uh, Chandan's work as well. Okay, so we have tons let of me, questions. Well, let me just say, can I just say one more thing about that? Because I thought that's really great, Aiko, which is, which is, I, I would put it that the state, the state of course does have to mediate capital, but the state in the same, just as much state has to mediate patriarchy and state has to mediate white supremacy. So it's not, um, and, and here, you know, sometimes I'm speaking with a certain allergy to certain dogmatic Marxist traditions that I'm trying to struggle against. And, um, and so it's not that there is a 
privileged relationship between capital and the state. I think the state has to, in some ways, mediate all of these forms of thing. And you're exactly right, I think, or it's interesting that you choose, choose primitive accumulation for that too, because I was thinking the ways that um, in Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism and also in um, Sylvia Federici's book about Caliban, both of them go back to primitive accumulation and try to reread it as, as one primitive accumulation as a, as a site of a, of a, of a racial um, construction of a European racial order and the other is a, as a patriarchal order that started through primitive accumulation. So in some ways, like the state primitive accumulation too functions as a, as a many-sided thing that's not the way of subsuming within capital all these other problems, but rather the site at which they all are, are being negotiated. Yes, no, uh, I think that's a great connect connection. And I think just, just to, in that sort of backward glance to uh, just wanted to add that, yeah, um, in thinking about if race is kind of something that's created or comes into formation in Europe, um, this sort of brings to light, you know, or this um, is the context for which, you know, Ruthie Gilmore would say that even if all white people were to disappear, <laughs> um, there would still be race. There would still be racism um, if we still live under a capitalist uh, system. So, um, so, I, so, so another um, point just to extend that one. Um, okay, so we have so much work to do because there's, <laughs> I'm being a terrible moderator. Okay, let's um, move on. Um, what political forms do we need to overcome these convergent intersectional entrenchments? Uh, are there ways forward through a unified political universalism, such as with a party? Uh, I think that is an interesting question in relation to Chandan's um, uh, points about reform and um, other forms of uh, uh, thinking in terms of, in, uh, well, I think reform, but especially liberal um, institutions. Or do you think articulated compositions like social movements are the way forward? Do we need a new political organize? new political organizations to confront capital. So I'll just, um, I don't know if Chandon, you wanna weigh in on this and then, sure. yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, the, and I'd be happy to um, pass it to, to Ashley and Michael as well. Um, I, I, maybe we could also just come back to uh, the last uh, conversation uh, and your your remarks on primitive accumulation, Iko, because I do think that one of the the most central insights of um, Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism that um, is built out by um, by intersectional thinking by Stuart Hall um, in the way that he are, you know reminds us that these categories, race, class, and gender, are not transparent reference to some positive knowledge, but they are like Althusser says that always are relation to these, uh, the, 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 the condition of production, the, our relationship to the mode of production. We don't have direct access to the mode of production like scientists who can um, diagnose, uh, you know, a, a cell, for example, under a, under a microscope. So, so, you know, as Asha was saying, the categories like class should be thought of as, as um, ways to help us think and grasp, um, but also knowing that they're mediating, as, as Ashley was saying, processes that are always um, the totality of those dynamics, you know, primitive accumulation and what we might call ordinary compulsion uh, relations, you know, or the, the daily compulsions for exploitation um, as not separate temporally um, or um, one as race and one as class, but as always simultaneous. And I think that, that um, you know, Cedric Robinson is constantly talk, arguing that, you know, did argue that we have to think of capitalism as always this um, uh, this economic process that coordinates abstraction with difference, rather than the annihilation of difference through abstraction, um, and and we are living and that that notion of having to coordinate abstraction difference as the function of capitalism is why all capitalism is racial capitalism in his point. Um, and, and, and I think that that is something that we really have to uh, hold on to. I also want to hold on to, to answer the question that is in the chat, um, you know, his definition of uh, the black radical tradition, which he's, he, and I, I'm quoting here, I, I just pulled it up, an accretion over generations 
of collective intelligence gathered from struggle. Um, that at a particular moment, you know, it can in, in be transformed into a radical force. And then this is his words, in its most militant manifestation is the overthrow of the whole race-based structure, which I think is also, um, you know, again, to go back to his notion of what a race-based structure is, is always conjoined with the abstracting processes of um, the economy and the, the mode of production. Um, and so, you know, I think that for me, the question isn't necessarily one of, whether we have parties or we have autonomous social movements. I think the question is, are, what are the mechanisms that are building up the collective intelligence of communities? Um, and um, how do we transact the uh, knowledges of collective intelligence of communities um, into what he calls a radical force um, for an overthrow of the race-based social structure or for, you know, for revolutionary conditions. And that is a real question. Did you know, um, I think that particularly under contemporary platform capitalism and the, you know, and, and Twitter and so forth, you know, we see both remarkable um, uh, emergent possibilities for the ways in which um, highly, localized, independent uh, uh, processes of learning people's conditions, um, learning the violences in their lives, learning the way that the state operates, which if you know, I mean, if you work in, for example, um, uh, carceral conditions, like if you have loved ones who are incarcerated or you yourself are incarcerated, if you work in immigration or you're subject to deportation or detention, um, if you are working in um, trying to secure housing, if you're houseless, you're really working with the tentacles in the US of an, and in Europe of an administrative state that is so complicated that most of the lawyers that work with you do not even know the best way to try to resolve oftentimes the, the, the rationales that the state has for being able to violate lives. And, you, and it's oftentimes communities who have got, had to go through administrative processes that know better the tactics and strategies for their own um, uh, escape from the tentacles of state violence, let's put it that way, if not liberation. Um, and so, so there is, I think, a question about how do you how do you maintain a commitment to a kind of ongoing democratic pluralization of um, of, of of voices for knowledge about our present. Um, and about the shared world in, under which we live um, with the, the needs to, to have some sets of um, concepts that you think will build revolutionary force. Um, and I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I wish I did, but I, but I do think that that's what people are struggling with. It's not as whether we should build a party or whether we should do um, let's say, you know, independent social movements. I do think that people who are trying to work on grassroots social movements are critical of things like um, the nonprofit sector, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, of, of party-based politics, um, precisely because those have been the moments that transformative um, non-dominant voices have once again been um, uh, suppressed and repressed um, by the logics of um, uh, 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 the, the institution that they work in. Thanks. Ashley? I'll just say I love this question because it's like, solve the revolution. And I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to do that? Like I wrote one, <laughs> I promise you don't, you don't, don't do what I say. Like, that's so silly, don't do what I say. <laughs> um, but I like, I think answering this question as an organizer rather than an academic, um, like my approach to organizing is what I like to call like a theory of grand maximalism. I'm like, let's do all the things. Um, having been involved in like small scale grassroots collectives that run on absolute anti-hierarchy and having been involved in nonprofits and having been part of social movements on several continents and having worked on like pieces of legislative reform, um, I will say that like each one of these forms, 
I've, I, I am not and have never been a member of the Communist Party, so I can't really speak to party politics and there are reasons for that. Um, but I, like, I will say that each one of these forms has structural limits and each one of these forms hides certain aspects of its own limitations and reproduces various forms of, of really toxic power dynamics, I think. Um, and so I, something that I think about social movements and change is actually to like do a Michael throwback is like the multiplicity itself is part of the strategy um, for me. That like we can, part of what I think is useful in robust movements for change is being able to like critique what other people are doing and be critiqued by others, both for our form and also for our process. And I, like my own approach to organizing is that the process is and influences the product of like where we get to is, is part of how, how we are going. And so like, I'm never gonna be a person to join a political party as the way forward in, in the revolution. I'm also never gonna be someone again, you know, who works with nonprofits, but that's not to say that there aren't roles in radical social transformation for people who are doing those things. So I think the question is like, how in whatever place you are organizing, how are you pushing like a more radical, a more inclusive, a more transformative, a more anti-capitalist position and process in your space? And how are these like various different approaches being in communication with each other to see our own limits, embrace our own humility and be able to like you zig, I zag when that's important for radical social transformation. I think that's my provisional answer. Michael, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think we should, we, we should probably go on. Okay, all right. Uh, all right, so uh, Ashley, this is actually just another question back to you. Um, what are some of the responses to your approach that you've encountered and wondering, um, the person is wondering about analytical and movement responses? Um, I will say mostly things have been pretty positive. People have, have been very like generally nice and warm with the exception of some mean people on the internet. Like internet brings out the worst in people, we all know that. Um, and I will say like, just totally, you know, the book is still new. So who knows, like, you know, what will happen, but I will say so far the reaction from activists has been even warmer than academics who I think are a chilly people by nature. Um, and, and who's like, you know, as academics, our whole thing is like, how can I disagree in, with like the micro differences of the thing that you said, because we read the same book and I have to say something slightly different than you. Whereas I think the approach in activist spaces has like takes, takes flight from a different place. Um, so yeah, I'm doing lots of workshops in activist spaces around how we transform our organizing in relationship to some of the stuff I talk about in the book. And I will say that has been an incredibly rewarding afterlife of this, this book project. I don't know if that's the answer they wanted. Thank you. Um, well, I, I guess I had a question just because we've some um, we've talked a little bit about Black Lives Matter. We've talked a little bit about historical, uh, you know, social movements and abolition has come up come up a few times. And I'm just wondering, uh, just maybe as a as a, a corollary to sort of thinking about multiplicity, but thinking about kind of interscalar uh, social movements. And I'm wondering if abolition is one of those sites of <laughs> interscalar um, social movement building, because when we think about prisons and their connections to borders, to military bases, it allows us to perhaps to, you know, again, let me quote uh, Chenin again, you know, to, to sort of um, find those, um, find that coherence across those different scales and 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 Chandan's own work in the university uh to, and also connecting the knowledge that we're building in the university that participates in this sort of carceral military system um as the sort of uh 
structure that upholds or reinforces our, you know, the capitalist system. So I'm just wondering if if people wanted to just weigh in on abolition as this kind of interscalar, uh, as having this kind of interscalar uh, potential um, that doesn't kind of, in a way, doesn't kind of isn't immediately race, isn't immediately gender, isn't, it sort of seems to move away from those identitarian categories and instead to thinking about uh, these interlocked systems. To, um, uh, and I'm not gonna be able to say Ashley's term, but does that too. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, who would like to begin? I can say it very quickly, just, yeah, just to start us off, um, which I, you know, I think, um, attracts all of these really uh, crucial um, black feminist radicals. Um, and, uh, and like you said, you know, she ends on family Hamer, but you know, we, in relationship to your question, I think we can really build here on um, the collective knowledge and intelligence we've received from Ruth Wilson Gilmore, you know? So, you know, when she analyzes the prison, one of the things that she's looking at is, you know, the buildup of the prison industrial complex to manage the condition of surpluses that it's emerging in the, the period that Michael and, and, and Antonio Negri des, uh, describe as empire, um, that that those surf, the, the, the management of those surpluses by the buildup of the prison has produced innovative and new conditions for organizing um, that have brought together, for example, rural communities with uh, that are predominantly white or that are uh, that are oftentimes really invested in settler colonial knowledges and repertoires of the possession of land and water uh, through title, for example, rather than um, uh, knowledges of, of land as relation that come from the communities in which they've, they've taken those lands for the product for for agricultural use and later for prison, connects those, those sites and places with highly um, uh, racialized uh, BIPOC communities in urban areas that oftentimes are the bodies that are fed into uh, the prison. Um, and so she's always looking at these important new conditions of possibility um, that, that, um, you know, the, that the repertoires of racial capitalism and settler colonialism um, are in the transformation of, of shifts in capital um, are also um, creating as contradictions and opportunities. Um, and I think that to the question that you're asking, you know, she, she tells us on the one hand, abolition is about local communities diagnosing the sort of who, what, when, and where, you know, like what are the conditions? What's going on? Um, you know, what do we need? How do we get it? Um, who's involved? What are the leverages of power? And, and then on the other hand, to, to, you know, she argues, um, you know, and her formulation is that abolition must be green in its relationship to land, red in its relationship to labor, and internationalist, um, uh, you, know, you know, in relationship to, 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 to capital um, and finance capital. And so I think that she's trying to do both, she's trying to train that interscalar thinking, you know, of, no, of learning how we jump scales and giving us language um, that abolition is the name for interscalar thinking. Shannon, could you, could you return to what you were saying earlier about non-analogous demands and put that in relation to it? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that, that, that social movements do really well, I think, is when, they, when they're bringing, uh, you know, what I was calling, for example, the recently disenfranchised together with the historically disenfranchised, one, there's those internal pedagogy moments, you know, where, um, where folks learn why um, the, why the kinds of ways that the recently different recently disenfranchised might want to admit a demand for change might actually reproduce um, uh, sort of the the uh, asymmetries um, uh, of the historically disenfranchised um, and so so one I think that there's that that moment of training internally like uh, when this is happening in abolition, where people who are coming together are being trained to think about why we can't call the police to solve, for example, um, I mean, this was happening way back in the 70s, right, when, and 80s, right, when VAWA was being, uh, the, the Violence Against Women Act was being passed, and the funding of battered women's shelters, but like, why we can't call the police to solve domestic violence, for example, um, uh, and, um, and what would happen if we allowed 
for feminists to collaborate with um, uh, police departments in eradicating intimate partner violence. Um, so I think that there's that, that training. And I think that in that moment, the training isn't just that like the police are bad, to, to know, um, but actually seeing what, what the relationship is between abolishing policing and transforming how cities create uh, use of their revenues. Um, and so when you move, like in Seattle, for example, one fourth of the general operating fund goes to policing. When you remove policing and you, and you take that revenue and you move it elsewhere, all of a sudden the, the solution to being a gendered worker who's kicked out of their, out of the workforce during COVID is an abolition demand to get rid of policing and to reuse those revenues for something like minimum basic income. Um, and so I think that, that people get trained up to see those connections and to start making the arguments about how policing and about how sort of the divisions of the state, the analytic divisions of the state have, have exactly been about advantaging one sector of society um, and continuing to produce you know, what I call disposability or what others have called you know, um, uh, the forgetting of these other parts of life, of, of social life. Does that help? I, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, if there was like, you know, a, a, if I were gonna write like a, a last chapter of the book now, the one case study I think from the 21st century that we have that really, that really exemplifies, I think the kind of politics that I find to be the most useful and the most effective against capitalism, it is abolition, both in terms of its analysis, right? As this like multi-scalar, multi-faceted, embroiled in, it has to be anti-capitalist, it has to be anti-racist, it has gender dimensions, like it's it's on stolen lands, like all of these levels that Ruthie Wilson Gilmore and Miriam Kaba and Ajaris Dixon and Shira Hassan and like so many others, Dean Spade, you know, we could go on and on, right? You know, uh, for forever about like all of the wonderful activists and academics who have really, um, moved abolition forward and have done so in a way that doesn't narrow the vision of what it means to abolish prisons and police. And this is where I think like the movement is so transformative and spectacular is that you have like the sort of multi-level, multi-scalar um, moment that speaks to the absolute interpenetration of class and race and gender and colonization and it's simultaneously a, you know, makes demands on our, per, our understandings of ourselves, our communities, our desires, like all the way up to like large scale international finance, right? And this is where I think um, abolitionism is really a model for thinking about how we could be approaching all of the other issues that we need to be talking about, right? immigration, sexual violence, uh, anti-capitalism, et cetera. Like there is something so powerful about a movement that has been able to articulate, enact, practice, and also make digestible to a pretty large scale audience, the way that all of these things work together and the scale of transformation that is required. And also I, I think like, the one other thing that I think abolition is, the abolitionist movement is doing so well is to say like, and we can do it. This isn't some like forward thinking utopian dream of an unattainable future alternative reality, right? Like people are practicing abolition all the time. And what we need is a world that supports and reinforces and like structurally brings us together to be abolitionists in common. Um, I think like that's, yes, this is the dream. This is the dream. Abolish everything. This is the new slogan. Abolish everything. That's way pithier than equal primordiality. Should have gone with that instead. Well, and I'll and I'll just say, like, you know, I think I think, for example, the way Palestinians have really built the solidarity with Black Lives Matter and abolition is really important um, to precisely show that the very use of property, title, courts, and policings to um, slowly but systematically 
um, depopulate an area um, like Sheikh Jarrah and Jerusalem um, is, is connected precisely to um, processes that are happening in the United States as well or in Turtle, on Turtle Island. So, I mean, I think that people are, are, are you know, these concepts are only going to produce the different world based upon who's taking them up um, and who we're listening to and how we're listening to them. And, you know, I just want to say right now, abolition is, an is both a crucial structure and like to go back to Michael's notion of a structure and dominance, you know, police by racial police violence or settler police violence is the structure and dominance. Um, and um, we're seeing a lot of academics, self included, talking about abolition. And, and we have to just pause, you know, and remind ourselves what Joy James says, which is, you know, this too can be institutionalized. You know, this too can be a moment in which the voices of communities that have held the vision of abolition are once again um, uh, not in the conversation as speakers, um, but as objects of analysis um, or as um, uh, you know, as as examples of state violence, but not as um, uh, uh, actors of our political movements. So, um, so you know, we're we're just we're in that moment. Any other comments? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think that um, I just wanted to maybe pick up on uh, just thinking about uh, the comment that uh, Chandan raised about just the state budgets and in particular the defund movement, which is um, you know trying to reallocate um, city and state budgets. And actually, I think that so far there have been a number of states. I think you know allocating maybe. Uh, reallocating funds up to maybe $750 million. I'm just wondering though, in terms of a structure of feeling, however, one of the things, a concept that my colleague Renyo Huang uses is this idea of carceral care that whenever there's a problem, we tend to look to some authority to fix it, right? Which is hence the uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which will allocate um, a combined $850 million to, uh, to the police and to the sort of data collection at a time of like unprecedented, you know, misery and immiseration of people during the pandemic. And, um, and also uh, the hate crimes bill that was just passed, I think yesterday, uh, which is about, again, data collection. And um, I don't know exactly how much money is going towards that, but is supposed to be in response to this notion of sort of exceptional um, violence against Asian Americans during the pandemic. So I'm wondering how do we um, maybe just, if, I guess, taking people uh, in organizing efforts, taking people where they actually are. Um, you know, not everybody has an intersectional maybe, <laughs> um, tool book in there, you know, so how do we, how do, uh, does anyone here have ideas about kind of um, shifting perceptions away from this, uh, this idea of carceral care, trying to have the state um, come up with solutions that ex in fact just expand, um, expand these very structures that, uh, of violence that, you know, victimize the people they're intended to protect. So just a question about carceral care and shifting away from that. Uh, into different forms of mutual aid, et cetera, but how to actually really accomplish that. Ashley, do you wanna take a stab at this? <laughs> no, uh, Michael? I, I was just thinking it's a great question, but I, I, it seems to me very hard to, um, to address in that, in that. Okay. In that frame, I just, at least I'm not occurring to me right now what at, a, a way of approaching it that would be adequate. Well, maybe I can just ask a, maybe a, a, a broader question then, um, which is just uh, thinking about how social movements can teach us something, um, you know, what what we've learned from the pandemic that, you know, COVID has taught us a lot. And a lot of things have happened that I actually would have never thought would have happened in, in particular. Uh, the, um, you know, 
abolish police uh, movement. I just never would have thought that that would have ever happened in, you know, my lifetime. Actually, so we see all we see these uh, radical uh, imaginaries kind of come to fruition in incredible ways at the same time as we see this incredible violence. So I'm just wondering um, uh, what type. What is it about maybe the pandemic to you uh, that what have you learned from the pandemic sort of looking out and then, you know, do, I mean, because it has offered a lot, I think a lot of clarity what what might be happening as we sort of turn the corner, at least in this country, a little bit um, away, from, you know, beyond the pandemic, how do we ensure that we can kind of stay focused on on these things. I mean, everything feels different, even the crisis in Palestine. It feel, a lot of people are saying it feels different this time. The outrage around it, it feels different and more intense. Is that just, us, is that hopeful? Is that, um, yeah. So I'm just sort of blathering on and on, but I'm just wondering if people have <laughs> some thoughts about these, these ideas, about the pandemic in particular. Pandemic pedagogies. Pandemic pedagogies. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I will say is that like breaking the assumption that the state can or wants to save us is, is like a real challenge in organizing because so often we think about the state as the collective democratic institution of governance and protection. It is obviously not that, right? Like it has never done that. Um, the state is a like necropolitical institution that is there in order to allow communities to perish and be pulverized and in order to sustain hierarchies and inequalities and deepen those patterns like the state does terrible things and yet one of the like collectively produced structurally produced ideological fictions of capitalism is that the state is the repository of our power when of course the state is there actually to take away our power and anyone that watched the protests of the last year knows that they will do that with guns and batons and tear gas and LRAD sound cannons and pepper balls and all the rest. Um, and, but one of, to like, like lift up something that I think has been really beautiful about the pandemic is that I think in the face of so much institutional neglect, medical neglect, economic neglect, at like health neglect, oh my gosh, healthcare, right? Like, um, what we saw, what I saw a lot of uh, communities doing, not only getting out into the street, even when it was even more risky than it always is, but also like cropping up of widespread mutual aid practices. And I think there's something incredibly pedagogical and instructive about the turn to mutual aid, which is a turn away from the assumption that state institutions are there to save us or will do it even in the hour of dire and urgent need. Of course, this is like not news to so many communities who have known for so long that the state is an active opponent of their survival and thriving. But I think something that we have seen over the past year that I think is instructive for activists, for social movements, for change, and that I hope we don't forget and like continue to grow on when the pandemic is over, if it's ever going to be over, who knows what that even means anymore. But it's like, we can and must create alternative institutions that serve us and our communities and set up the stage for building other worlds. Like the Black Panthers knew this very well and did this meeting the needs of community is in a certain sense, like the definition of communism, right? Is like a society based on human need um, and that that fulfills the conditions for, for our liberation. And so I think there have been moments and, and spurts of this in the past and we're living through a moment of it as well that I hope the pandemic, if we take a lesson out of it, besides like, you know, abolish capitalism in the state and all the other is like one of the things we all need to be doing more of is, um, mutual aid and direct provisioning for, for ourselves and our communities and our loved ones in opposition to the way that the state is positioned against us. I, I see a comment in here from Phil actually <laughs> um, asking, uh, you know, but the state is also a field of struggle, right? Um, 
are we risking um, reifying it as necropolitical? Um, so I'm just what, yeah. So I don't know if that's another question that you want to take up. Because I mean, thinking about healthcare in particular, the state would actually probably be the you know the um, institutional form of distributing um, healthcare, for example, right? So, yeah, sure. And we can make not we can make demands for non-reformist reforms, right? Saying that I demand that the state provide a service is not the same thing as saying because I think the state is a great institution who's there to support my survival. And I think we can make them like I, I think this is like the great insight of the organizing dictum of of making non-reformist reforms and making impossible demands and using what demands get met in order to mobilize for further for further liberation so like yeah sure the state occasionally does a thing that's less bad than other things it does like that's okay i wonder if this could go back to something you said much earlier uh shannon about uh, cycles of retrenchment. It seems like then you were talking about this relationship between reform and revolution or or the need for both. Could you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, uh, I, I, I hear what Philip is saying as well. Um, for example, you know, uh, take Palestinian struggle um, very, uh, very quickly, you know, what what is becoming clearer is that um, the so one solution to the the contemporary condition is a one state solution that is truly democratic. Um, you know the two state solution is precisely um, the solution that is continuing um, to produce the the asymmetries of of colonialism. Um, and so, um, what a one state solution is like? What kind of state, quote unquote? that one state solution that is an anti-apartheid state is one that we are yet to even know how to fully uh, uh, narrate um, as, uh, as a possibility. Um, you know, it's too soon. Like we might only know from historical hindsight, if we were to make that win, if that win were to come about, that there was a one state solution in all of Palestine that governed, um, you know, what are now nationally known as Israelis um, and uh, 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 Arabs and Palestinians um, together um, in a non-apartheid way, what the uh, abstractions are that allow for um, that world to flourish um, and whether those abstractions can connect to the forms of, of historical memory and cultural memory needed um, to make sure that we are living in meaningful relationality, um, you know, that is yet to be seen. Um, and, and we and will only be able to be diagnosed by people a hundred years from now, um, if that win were to happen. So I do want to keep open that there are imaginaries of um, a state. I mean, I think I think Veronica Gago is, a, is another person who's clearly thinking about this. Um, you know, imaginaries of the possibility of a state increasingly receding in the global south, but from the global south, um, that we are yet to know uh, 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 what could emerge from from the conjoining of those histories of struggle um, with the concept. Um, but to 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 go back to um, Michael, your question, uh, were, you, were you wondering about sort of what to do with the, with the condition of retrenchment that seems to be a constant feature of, of um, uh, moving into reformist um, politics? Yeah, it seemed to me that it was intersecting what Ash, with what Ashley was saying, where the um, uh, demands for reform in some ways get turned around. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, no, I think that's right. And I think maybe it also connects to what Aiko was saying about um, carceral care. Like, you know, how do, we, how do we undo the technologies in our brains that um, transform our, the moments in which we're able to imagine using state spaces into conditions of possibility for retrenchment. Like there's actually things in the ways that we think politics, the ways that we think social relations, the ways that we um, think one, uh, our relationship to one another as citizens, for example, 
instead of as those of us with cultural memories that have to be shared and related to with different histories of uh, relationship to universalism um, that come into how we can understand each other as speaking subjects and as living subjects and as subjects that care for one another. Like, I think that th that there's a, the, the effort right now in a lot of very local areas is trying to figure out precisely how we undo the, the, our computational minds that constantly produce carceral care, you know, um, so that so that maybe we get better at seeing those moments of um, uh, retrenchment. Um, and I do think, you know, one of the things that's really exciting about both Black Lives Matter and about the Palestinian liberation struggle right now is that they are doing that work by precisely taking contradictions that were clearly um, ruptured in part because of an explicitly white supremacist Trumpian regime and not allowing the Democrats to get away with it on their watch. You know, like both the demand to stop prison building and policing and the demand to stop talking about, um, so language about both sides in relationship to the asymmetrical war of Israel upon Palestinians have been led by Black Lives Matter movement and Palestinian liberation movement that is disallowing our, our brains to act like, you know, it's bad when it's done by Trumpian white supremacists, but let's give the Democrats a chance, you know, which is what's happening in immigration. You know, um, they're increasing immigration detention, but people are like, oh no, but Biden really cares about children. So I think that, you know, we are seeing the successes of those efforts to um, speak with um, uh, retrenchment as a constant dynamic. We're at 3.50 and um, I think that we should maybe uh, wind down. Does anyone have any final thoughts before we, we wrap up? Only to say thank you to Ashley for doing the work of writing this book and all the work of, of trying to build our, our collective um, you know, intelligence. It's so important. Yeah, I just want to reiterate to how clear the book is and how useful it is. I mean, I, I, I've going to teach the book and it's it's really it's a, it's a perfect um synthesis of so many complicated ideas but um you know packaged in such a in such a digestible way so i really applaud the book um and in terms of thinking about just chandan's points about you know really how are we going to start thinking differently i mean right now we we are in a system uh, that requires social relations that are basically anti-relational right so you know, so I think that the reason we look to the state or we look to authority figures is because of that, of the way that the social relations required by capitalism turn, you know, abundance into scarcity, interdependence into isolation, and that isolation is what makes us call the police, call 911, and then also what turns matter into waste. So, um, so hopefully we can continue the momentum, hopefully that the pandemic has given us to, to work on those, uh, those structures of interdependence, um, abundance, and, um, and beautiful matter. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it, I think, back to Philip, and, um, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Aiko, and thank you particularly Ashley, Chandon, and Michael. Uh, I think the phrase building our collective intelligence uh, uh, might serve to characterize the goal of Red Way. And when I say our collective intelligence, I don't mean those people out there, but I mean a mine and also, uh, you know, even our panelists, because we don't subscribe to that banking novel of banking model of filling people up with information. It's the process of developing collective action and the collective mind uh, in the good sense that we are, we are for. And, uh, you know, in this particular, the discussion of the state was very interesting. It fills a, a function that uh, lapsed a few days ago when we had a state discussion that evolved into something else, uh, which it, it just did, and you know, one runs with the flow on those things. Uh, and certainly, Palestine needs all the solidarity it can get at the moment, and it needs more. Uh, but again, thank you. And let me uh, uh, 
let me quickly clue you into uh, some things that are up uh, in the next few days at uh, uh, five o'clock this evening, Pacific time, the asset economy and the logic of speculation with uh, uh, Lisa Atkins, Stephen Shaviro, and uh, um, Martin Konings uh, at uh, 11 a.m. tomorrow, a conversation between Sandra Mazadra in Italy and Jason Reed uh, uh, in uh, Maine on uh, Marx producing subjects. Uh, uh, two thinkers who admire each other's works but have never talked together. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And then uh, Thursday at uh, 11, uh, Thursday at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, how to weaponize or defuse a constitution that comes at this glorious moment in Chile, which we, I guarantee you, we will talk about uh, probably at length. So I hope to see you at those. Uh, you know the drill about giving money, www.redmayseattle.org. Donate, uh, and also in the YouTube uh, description of this event, you can have a link which goes to our donation. Uh, thank you all, hope to see you later, enjoy the rest of the day.